Chapter Eight, Part One of Gigolo by Edna Ferber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. If I should ever travel, Part One. The fabric of my faithful love, no power shall dim or ravel, whilst I stay here. But oh, my dear, if I should ever travel, Millet. If you've spent more than one day in Okuchi, Oklahoma, you've had dinner at Pardee's. Someone, a business acquaintance, a friend, a townsman, has said, Oh, you stoppin' at the Oak Mulgy Hotel? Wonderful, isn't it? Nothing finer here to the coast. I bet you thought you were coming to the wilderness, didn't you? You Easterners! think we live in tents and eat jerked venison and maize, huh? Never expected, I bet, to see a twelve-story hotel with separate ice-water faucet in every bathroom and a bath to every room. What'd you think of the Peacock Grill, hmm? Well, uh, hesitatingly, very nice, but uh, why don't you have something native? Decorations and... Mm, peacock grill is new york not okla that's so well let me tell you you won't find any better food or service in any restaurant new york or i don't care where but say hotel meals are hotel meals you get tired of em ever eat at parties up the street say there's food if you're going to be here in town any time, why don't you call up there some evening before six? You have to leave them know. And get one of Pardee's dinners. Thursday's chicken. And when I say chicken, I mean, well, just try it, that's all. And for God's sake, don't make a mistake and tip Maxine. Pardee's you find to be a plain, box-like, two-story frame house, in a quiet and commonplace residential district, plainly, almost scantily furnished as to living room and dining room. The dining room comfortably seats just twenty, but the Pardee's take eighteen diners, no more. This is because Mrs. Pardee has eighteen of everything in silver. And that means eighteen of everything, from grapefruit spoons to cheese knives, and finger bowls before and after until you feel like an early roman as for maxine the friendly warning is superfluous you would as soon have thought of slipping hebe a quarter on olympus a rather severe featured hebe in a white silk blouse ordered through vogue all this should have been told in the past tense, because Pardee's is no more. But Okuchi, Oklahoma, is full of paradoxes like Pardee's. Before you understand Maxine Pardee and her mother, you have to know Okuchi. And before you know Okuchi, you have to know Sam Pardee missing. There are all sorts of stories about Okuchi, Oklahoma, and almost every one of them is true. Especially are the fantastic ones true, the incredible ones. The truer they are, the more do they make such Arabian nights as Aladdin and Ali Baba appear dull and worthy gentlemen in the retail lamp and oil business, respectively. Ali Baba's exploit in oil, indeed, would have appeared too trivial for recounting if compared with that of any one of a dozen Okuchi oil wizards. Take the tale of the Barstows alone, though it hasn't the slightest bearing on this story. Thirteen years ago the Barstows had a parched little farm on the outskirts of what is now the near metropolis of Okuchi, but what was then a straggling village in the Indian territory. Ma Barstow was a woman of thirty-five who looked sixty, withered by childbearing, scorched by the sun, beaten by the wind, 
gnarled with toil, gritty with dust. Ploughing the barren little farm one day, Clem Barstow had noticed a strange oily scum. It seeped up through the soil and lay there, heavily. Oil! Weeks of suspense, weeks of disappointment, weeks of hope. Through it all, Ma Barstow had washed, scrubbed, cooked, as usual, and had looked after the welfare of the Barstow litter. Seventeen years of drudgery dull the imagination. When they struck the great gusher, it's still known as Barstow's Old Faithful, they came running to her with the news. She had been washing a great tubful of harsh, greasy clothes, overalls, shirts, drawers. As the men came, shouting, she appeared in the doorway of the crazy wooden lean-to, wiping her hands on her apron. Oil, they shouted idiotically. Millions, biggest gusher yet. It'll mean millions. You're a millionaire. Then, as she looked at them, dazedly, What are you going to do, Miss Barstow, huh? What are you going to do with it? Ma Barstow had brought one hand up to push back a straggling wisp of damp hair. Then she looked at that hand as she brought it down, looked at it and its mate, parboiled, shrunken, big knuckled from toil. She wiped them both on her apron again, bringing the palms down hard along her flat thighs. Do! The miracles that millions might accomplish burst full force on her work-numbed brain. Do! First off, I'm a-going to have the washin' done out. Last week, Mrs. Clement Barstow was runner-up in the women's amateur golf tournament, played on the Okuchi eighteen-hole course. She wore tweed knickers. The Barstow Place on the Edgecombe Road is so honeycombed with sleeping porches, sundials, swimming pools, bird baths, terraces, sunken gardens, and Italian marble benches that the second assistant Japanese gardener has to show you the way to the tennis courts. It was inevitable that Sam Pardee should hear of Okuchi and, hearing of it, drift there. Sam Pardee was drawn to a new town, a boom town, as unerringly as a small boy since a street fight. Born seventy-five years earlier, he would certainly have been one of those intrepid forty-niners, a fearless, canvas-covered fleet crawling painfully across a continent, conquering desert and plain and mountain, starving, thirsting, fighting Indians, eating each other, if necessity demanded, with equal dexterity and dispatch. Perhaps a trip like this would have satisfied his wanderlust. Probably not. He was like a child in a berry patch. The fruit just beyond was always the ripest and reddest. The Klondike didn't do. He was one of the first up the Yukon in that mad rush, he returned, minus all the money and equipment with which he had started, including the great toe of his right foot, tribute levied by the frozen north. From Boomtown to Boomtown he went. The first stampede always found him there, deep in blueprints, engineering sheets, prospectuses. But no sooner did the town install a waterworks and the First National Bank housed itself in a Portland cement Greek temple with Roman pillars and a mosaic floor, then he grew restless and was on the move. A swashbuckler, Sam Pardee, in tan shoes and a brown derby. An 1890 Villon, handicapped by a home-loving wife. An incurable romantic, married to a woman who judged as shiftless any housewife possessed of less than two dozen bath towels, twelve tablecloths, eighteen washcloths, and at least three dozen dish towels, hand-hemmed. 
Ma Pardee's idea of adventure was testing the recipes illustrated in the How to Use the Cheaper Cuts page in the back of the woman's magazines. Perversely enough, they had been drawn together by the very attraction of dissimilarity. He had found her feminine, home-loving qualities most appealing. His manner of wearing an invisible cloak, sword, and buckler, though actually garbed in ready-maids, thrilled her. She had come of a good family, he of, seemingly, no family at all. When the two married, Millie's people went through that ablutionary process known as washing their hands of her. Thus ideally mismated, they tried to make the best of it, and failed. At least, Sam Pardee failed. Millie Pardee said, Goodness knows I tried to be a good wife to him. The plaint of all unappreciated wives since Griselda. Theirs was a feast and famine existence. Sometimes Sam Pardee made sudden thousands. Mrs. Pardee would buy silver, linen, and other household furnishings, ranging all the way from a grand piano to a patent washing machine. The piano and the washing machine usually were whisked away within a few weeks or months, at the longest, but she cannily had the linen and silver stamped, stamped unmistakably and irrevocably, with a large, flourishing capital P embellished with floral wreaths. Eventually, some of the silver went the way of the piano and washing machine, but Millie Pardee clung stubbornly to a dozen and a half of everything. She seemed to feel that if once she had less than eighteen fish forks, the last of the solid ground of family respectability would sink under her feet. For years she carried that silver about, wrapped in trunks full of the precious linen and in old underwear and cotton flannel kimonos, and Sam's silk socks and Maxine's discarded baby clothes. She clung to it desperately, as other women cling to jewels, knowing that when this is gone no more will follow. When the child was born, Millie Pardee wanted to name her Myrtle, but her husband had said suddenly, No, call her Maxine. After whom? In Mrs. Pardee's code, you named a child after someone. He had seen Maxine Elliot in the heyday of her cold, clear, brainless beauty, with her great, slightly protuberant eyes set so far apart, her exquisitely chiseled white nose, and her black, black hair. She had thrilled him. "'After my Uncle Max that lives in uh, Australia. "'I've never heard you talk of any Uncle Max,' said Mrs. Pardee coldly. "'But the name had won. "'How could they know that Maxine would grow up to be a rather bony young woman "'who preferred these high-collared white silk blouses and said, "'Either.' "'Maxine had been about twelve when Okuchi beckoned Sam Pardee. They were living in Chicago at the time, had been there for almost three years, that is, Mrs. Pardee and Maxine had been there. Sam was in and out on some mysterious business of his own. His affairs were always spoken of as deals or propositions, and they always seemingly required his presence in a city other than that in which they were living, if living can be said to describe the exceedingly impermanent perch to which they clung. They had a four-room flat. Maxine was attending a good school. Mrs. Pardee was using the linen and silver daily. There was a linen closet down the hall, just off the dining room. You could open the door and feast your eyes on orderly piles of neatly laundered towels, sheets, 
tablecloths, napkins, tea towels. Mrs. Pardee, marketed and cooked contentedly. She was more than a merely good cook, she was an alchemist in foodstuffs. Given such raw ingredients as butter, sugar, flour, eggs, she could evolve a structure of pure gold that melted on the tongue. She could take an ochreous old hen, dredge its parts in flour, brown it in fat sizzling with onion at the bottom of an iron kettle, add water, a splash of tomato, and a pinch of seasoning, and bear triumphantly to the table a platter heaped with tender fricassee over which a smooth saddle-brown gravy simmered fragrantly. She ate little herself, as do most expert cooks, and found her reward when Sam or Maxine uttered a choked and appreciative mmm. In the midst of creature comforts such as these, Sam Pardee said one evening, Oil. Mrs. Pardee passed it, but not without remonstrance. It's the same identical French dressing you had last night, Sam. I mixed enough for twice, and you didn't add any oil last night. Sam Pardee came out of his abstraction long enough to emit a roar of laughter, and an unsatisfactory explanation. I was thinking of oil in wells, not in cruets. Millions of barrels of oil, not a spoonful. Crude, not olive. She saw her child, her piece, her linen closet, threatened. Sam Pardee, you don't mean... Oklahoma, that's what I meant by oil. It's oozing with it. Real terror leaped into Millie Pardee's eyes. Not Oklahoma. Sam, I couldn't stand. Suddenly she stiffened with resolve. Maxine's report card had boasted three stars that week. Oklahoma. Why, there probably were no schools at Oklahoma. I won't bring my child up in Oklahoma. Indians, that's what, scouts in our beds. Above Sam Pardee's roar sounded Maxine's excited treble. Ooh, Oklahoma, I'd love it. Her mother turned on her almost fiercely. You wouldn't. The child had thrown out her arms in a wide gesture. It sounds so far away and different i like different places i like any place that isn't here millie pardee had stared at her it was the father talking in the child any place that isn't here different out of years of bitter experience she tried to convince the child of her error tried, as she had striven for years, to convince Sam Pardee. Places are just the same, she said bitterly, and so are people when you get to them. They can't be, the child argued stubbornly. India and China and Spain and Africa? Millie Pardee had turned accusing eyes on her amused husband. I hope you're satisfied. He shrugged. Well, the kid's right. That's living. She disputed this fiercely. It is not. Living's staying in a place and helping it grow and growing up with it and belonging. Belong. It was the cry of the rolling stone that is bruised and weary. Sam Pardee left for Oklahoma the following week. Millie Pardee refused to accompany him. It was the first time she had taken this stand. If you go there and like it and want to settle down, I'll come. I know the Bible says, Whither thou goest I will go, but I guess even what's-her-name would have given up at Oklahoma. 
For three years, then, Sam Pardee's letters reeked of oil. Wells, strikes, gushers, drills, chairs, outfits. It was early Oklahoma in the rough. This one was getting five hundred a day out of his well. That one had sunk forty thousand in his and lost out. Five hundred what? Maxine asked. Forty thousand what? Dollars, I guess, Millie Pardee answered. That's the way your father always talks. I'd rather have twenty-five a week myself, and know it's coming without fail. I wouldn't. Where's the fun in that? Fun. There's more fun in twenty-five a week in a pay envelope than in forty thousand down a dry well. Maxine was fifteen now. I wish we could live with father in Oklahoma. I think it's wrong not to. Millie Pardee was beginning to think so, too, especially since her husband's letters had grown rarer as the checks they contained had grown larger. On his occasional trips back to Chicago, he said nothing of their joining him out there. He seemed to have grown accustomed to living alone liked the freedom, the lack of responsibility. In sudden fright and resolve, Millie Pardee sold the furnishings of the four-room flat, packed the peripatetic linen and silver, and joined a surprised and rather markedly unenthusiastic husband in Okuchi, Oklahoma. A wife and a fifteen-year-old daughter take a good deal of explaining on the part of one who has posed for three years as a bachelor. End of chapter 8, part 1